You didn't go to work by yourself. He was with you. You didn't go to that job by yourself. He was with you. Even if you went to the hospital, he was there with you. While you were in the courtroom, he was there with you. While you had those conversations, good or bad, positive or negative, he was there with you. When you wrote the check, he was there. We didn't have the money to pack up the check. He was there. He's here right now. He's here right now. The highest occupation a human being can hold is called worshiper. Is Jesus looking for you this morning? And if he is, can he find you this morning? He said, I'm looking for those that will serve me and worship me in spirit and in truth. Are you here this morning? Don't let the rocks take your place. Don't let the birds, don't let the arms, don't let whatever it is, don't let it take your place. Be responsible for your own praise. Be responsible for your own worship. Why? Because can't nobody do it like Jesus. They wasn't there when you was going through. They weren't there when you were coming out. He was the only one with you in your darkest days. Even when you turned against yourself, your God was still on your side. When you didn't even understand yourself, he still showed love and patience. Long suffering. So the least we can do is to give him the fruit of our lips. The least we can do is remind him of how awesome he is. We thank you, Jesus, from the bottom of our heart to the soles of our feet. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your glory. We thank you for your honor. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your joy. We just thank you for just being you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Give God a hand, praise. Not a pity pat, not a high five, but a praise. I'm glad for this week that God brought you through. Health-wise, financially-wise, I'm really glad there was nobody but Jesus. It's a cliche song, but it's so true. When I think of the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done for me, what does your soul do? Can I get some soul in here? I know we got to have some soul. If it don't come from your mouth, let it come from your soul. Amen. Amen. You may be seated in all these free seats. Amen. I'm glad you made it. Would you tell two people I missed you? I didn't say borrow no money. I just said say I miss you. Don't ask for a ride home. Just miss me. Amen. You're worth missing. You know, people can, I don't understand this. I, I had this conversation a few weeks ago when I was out of the country. I said, you know, we don't been here for like seven, eight days and we ain't spoke a good, good morning to each other like this. What is wrong with that? How are we going to go to glory and give him praise when we talk to each other on earth? It's just good morning. It's not a negative thing at all. Sometimes folk are shy, or whatever you want to call it. But you know, sometimes your shyness looks like you just stuck up. We don't, nobody can't read your mind. Some people assume just because your face is looking straight ahead and you're not smiling, and they assume that you're just a distant kind of person. A lot of misunderstanding happens in church because people haven't spoken to somebody, and they make the assumption that this person doesn't want to talk to me, and they look at me with an attitude. And now you got a whole sermon on your haters in church. Just, sometimes you'll be the first one. The Bible said we want to have friends do what? Everybody know that verse, but don't do it. Now, I didn't say show yourself to your already friend. The implication is to have another friend to add to your Facebook page or your Instagram, whatever. Show yourself friendly. That means you make the attempt. You make the sacrifice and see what God's going to do. Amen. How many be blessed? No, no, I got a better question. How many hope a person with a couple million dollars walk your path and say, you know what? Look at all these hands. Now, if you act like stuck up, I might walk right past you. That person might say, the first person that grinned at me, I'm cutting the check. But you won't show a denture. You won't show a toothless. And your money just walk right by you. I didn't say flirt. 
All right, so good, just, just simply say, hey, smile. Amen. Kirk Franklin made a whole song about it. Got well paid, I heard. <laughs> All right, God bless you. So, Siobhan, I heard about the situation with your family. Our condolences to you and your family and the tragedy that took place. We're here to support you in our prayers. I think they lost a family member, a young lady, maybe 18 years old, if I'm not mistaken. That's very, very young for someone to call home at that time. And I'm sure it was a shock to the family. But we're praying that God bring the healing because that's trauma. You know, those are traumatic moments. And even though you have faith, your faith can be shaken. You know, you believe God, but things could be shaken to the point that you don't know what to do. So let's support them. Uh, also, we have several uh, homegoing services that's going to take place this week. If you can participate, that's fine. Uh, one will be first and foremost, not to disparage the other person, but uh, our own Deacon Tony. I just call him Deacon Dinner. I'm going to keep that on because he acted like one. He battled, and I may be mistaken in my years, but I'm sure of that. At least it's a more 27 years of dealing with kidney issues. And survived when the doctors probably gave him up many a time. And uh, the last time I had a call with him, uh, he sounded down just a bit. But the moment we start quoting verses in scripture, he just bounced right back and stopped being the brother Tony that we know. He's always had an encouraging word, always smiling, always serving, always willing to work, supported me like you would not believe. There was no question about his loyalty and commitment to our ministry. So if you can make it out to honor this great man of God that served to help sort of the spirit become sort of the spirit, then we should be there. If you, if you can, this Friday, uh, the details are, let me see if I can put them out here. Who's my home going committee? Juan and Betty, formerly known as missionary missionary and deaconess. Can't just, without giving their titles, give me one moment here. Uh, check with them after service, and they'll, they'll give you the details to be a part of that service. Then my own uncle, uh, Apostle Johnny Drakeford's father, has gone on to be with the Lord after 93 years of serving on the planet Earth as a man of God, as a deacon, and he'll be uh, remembered in turn this Thursday, this Thursday, uh, so you can come out and celebrate that fellowship of life. He's a great man of God. We work together in a job, in a secular job, but uh, as a supporter of his son, I witnessed his faithfulness in ministry. And I was telling uh, my cousin, uh, Johnny, last night, I said, your dad supported you like I've never seen a man support another family member. Because he didn't consider, well, my son is a pastor and I'm a deacon. He served the man of God. He didn't look at status. He didn't look at, well, I'm the oldest and I'm this and that. He believed in his ministry. And not just believed in his ministry. He served and showed in the church and financially supported and anything that man needed, he was there for him. So he was a true man of God and I'm proud to know him as my personal uncle and as a true great man of God. He actually sets a standard for me for what I look for in our church, for deacons and for men of God because I've seen faithfulness. I watched it happen right in front of me. So I'm, uh, that great example he set, uh, we're there for him and his family as need be. All right. What else we got here? Happy birthday for everybody that was born. I'm glad you made it. You look lovely. Get yourself a big cupcake and one candle. Amen. That's how they do it now, you know? When you're your third 21, don't lie. Just get one candle and figure out the rest. Then I don't know what I, I, I think I made some people mad some, pla some places. Celebrate your blessing of being alive. Amen. Could have been another way. So celebrate the fact that God kept you another year and all the things that happened this year may not have been pleasant to you, but have been here to bless you for being long for longevity's sake. Amen. All right, so thank God for you being around another year. Look forward to seeing you next year. The Lord tarry. All right, and the creek don't rise. back. I think that means don't wear high water shoes at that time. All right, let's get into the word of God. I feel like prophesying and praying to a few people here this morning, but that's, see what the Lord's saying. And I'm working on something here, developing certain things here, and I want you to work with me to, um, to develop this, uh, develop this thinking of the spirit the Lord has laid on my heart. And at certain points, you can read books, but you have to live a book too. 
The Bible calls us living epistles. The New Testament has the epistles, which are letters. Letters written by the apostles to the church to encourage them, to give them instructions on their behavior and how to understand who God is and how to understand who themselves are. But the scripture says we are living epistles. Literally, when you read the word of God, God etches that word in your heart, your soul, your spirit. The word of the Lord is the DNA that builds up your spirit man. And when you find yourself struggling with temptation, uh, struggling with thoughts about yourself, not knowing who you are in Christ, you're probably not digesting enough word as you should. It's affecting, you know, when you don't eat right, certain things happen in your body, reflects in your skin, reflects in your attitude, your behavior. Uh, you get a good meal, get the right nutrients, right vitamins, things change. The same thing with the word of God. People look at the word of God as something that I only do on Sunday, but you have to supplement. Somebody say supplement, please. Like you take vitamins, you have to supplement your soul and your spirit with the word of God. That's why he says man should not live by what? But, right, 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 right. Now let's ask the question, how much bread have you eaten this week? Oprah came out and confessed, I love bread. I have a carb addiction. And that's common. But the bread of life should be digested as often as you eat natural food. That's the implication. As, as, as you eat a regular meal, you should have a regular spiritual diet of the word of God. And if you don't understand it, that's not bad. So Pastor Brown, why that be bad? Because now you and the Holy Ghost can work together. You got a good reason to tell him to lead you and guide you to all truth, like he promised he would. And you bring back to God his promise that he would lead and guide you to all truth, especially at a place right now you feel stuck. Sometimes God wants you to get stuck. Yeah. Because you can't get certain things out. You said, blessed are they thirst and hunger. If you ain't thirsty, he can't bless you. If you ain't hungry, he can't bless you. So sometimes you think you're losing because you, I've lost my hunger, I've lost my appetite. It might be a season got you going through to change your diet. You know, I don't know about you, but I burnt out certain foods. I love them too much till I get tired of them. So I, I gotta get 10 of them till I can't take it no more. Then I, I don't even look in any direction no more because I don't eat them to the point the taste is gone. And so, but the word of God is fresh. It stays fresh. And if you need a breakthrough, it may need, you might need a more Bible breakthrough than a financial breakthrough. And the fact is, God has money for you, but your mind ain't ready for the money. Because he's not trying to give you money for now. He's trying to give you money for later, too. He's not trying to give you money for now. He wants you to have money management. More than having money, if you can manage the money, it don't matter how much money you got, you can always make more because you know how to manage it. But then that make sense. So you don't have to chase after the money. The money will chase after you. But are you worth chasing after? Now remember now, that's a neutral thing. It has no direction till you give it direction. Money is basically neutral. That's why the Lord said, the poor you will always have among you. He didn't try to make everybody wealthy because everybody don't want to have money management. Everybody don't want to be good stewards. Everybody don't want to have a self-giving heart. There's, there are issues that he understands. It's not going to resolve all your answers. Those scriptures that says money answers all things. At the same time, put it in context. The context is that God who gives the money causes the answer to come from the I don't know why I'm going to the rest of the Somebody may be praying for somebody. But understand that it might not be a prophecy that somebody's going to do this for you financially, but you are going to be a person that is fit for the finances that God wants to bring in your life. Right. So the last question I'm going to ask about this, how many have lost money? I ain't talking about what you bought at the mall. But some significant amounts. Yeah. Taught you a lesson, right? All right. Teach you a lesson. So that's a good lesson. You pay tuition. Do what was the lost was the tuition for you. Okay, uh, the scripture I'm going to use this morning is some of what I'm going to talk about this morning. You may have heard last Sunday, but it's going to sound a little better, a little different, because I know I'm going to talk about a little bit more. All right, Mark chapter 2, verses 2 to the living, to the living, to the living. I'm talking to the living. The problem is I'm reading and talking at the same time. I found from personal experience, wisdom is not being smart all the time, but being smart at the right time. I found that out. I've assumed that to be smart, you had to be smart all the time, which kind of implies you need to have all the answers all the time. No, not really. 
you need to have the right answer at the right time. That's the separates the leader from the follower. The leader knows when to use the right time. Because sometimes the wisdom may be somewhere else and somebody else. And if you're the smartest person in the room, you need another room to challenge your smartness. Isn't that right? So finding the right time to do things is important as just knowing what to say. There's a right season for everything. Amen. Right now, you are in a season, whether you understand it or not, whether you discern it or not. It's a common word that we use all the time in the church world. I don't want to make it a cliche because it's coming that way, but this your season, that's your season. What does that literally mean in your life? Because a chronological clock is not necessarily determining seasons for the spiritual realm. The calendar may not line up with spring, summer, and fall as we know it to be. So your season may be different than the person sitting next to you and vice versa. We're not all, all, even though we're all under the same sun, it's hitting us at different times. Everybody on the planet getting hit by the same sun, but it's affected in different ways. Some places are hotter, some places are cooler. Matter of fact, in some parts of the country, while we're going through spring, they're going into fall. Just opposite of what we're doing, depending on what hemisphere they're in. So there's a season you're in now versus trying to look for a season, and when my season comes, who are you in it? Right now. Now, it might be winter for you, cold, chilly, ain't nothing growing, but it's a season of rest. Snow is giving the ground a rest. So then when spring comes, the ground is more fertile from the wet from the snow. The water comes down from the mountain, from the snow that melts, it brings the river. All those different things taking place in that season. There's a reason why there has to be that context. Summertime, maybe for somebody else, where you're enjoying the harvest. It might be a time that you're planting the harvest. When you're planting, it's a difficult time because during the planting season, you have less to work with because you're putting too much in the ground or putting so much in the ground, you have less in your hand. So you're assuming because I'm putting everything in the ground, less in my hand, I'm broke. No, you're sowing and you're waiting for the power of God to impact what you planted. And that's going to take a little time. So do not confess negativity and confess that God ain't blessing because you ain't seen the results of what you planted unless you planted your seed in the wrong dirt. Right, you got good seed and bad dirt, that don't work. You, know, you have to find the ground that you sow into so you can prosper as the Lord designed you to prosper. So we have to determine to detect what season you may be currently in. No matter what time or season you're in, it's a time of growth. Amen? I want to give you something before I read this scripture about, well no, let me read the scripture first and then I'll get into some things I'm just going to read from this, uh, my notes here versus sometimes just explaining my notes. I'm going to read some of this. Mark chapter 2, 2, 11 says this. While he was preaching God's word to them, four men arrived carrying a paralyzed man on a mat. They couldn't bring him to Jesus because of the crowd. So they dug a hole to the roof above his head. Then they lowered the man on his mat right down in front of Jesus. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, my child, your sins are forgiven. Just want to do a side note about that particular statement because it kind of throws off on why the man came through the roof. He didn't come to the roof to repent. He didn't come to the roof to get salvation. He came to the roof to get healed. He didn't, he didn't say, Lord, I feel like I'm a sinner and I need salvation. But the Lord addressed a deeper issue. When he said, your sins are forgiven you, he wasn't implying that because you're on that mat because of sin. He's implying that I have a long-term blessing for you. You just want to get up off that mat, but I want to bless your entire life. So going forward from here, that your, signs of, your sins are forgiven you, you got not only get new legs, you got a brand new life. A condemnation-free life. Because your sins are forgiven, which means you and I are good. You have right standing with me, literally, because you came to the roof, you sought my, my faith, and because you sought me, I'm not going to just give you a miracle, I'm going to change your life. So when you get up off this mat, you're not going to just live different. You're going to walk different. You're going to be different. And the outcomes of your life are going to be a lot better than it was before you came down to this room. So let's address the deeper issue, not just your temporary issue with your legs ain't working. Let's deal with your heart condition, too. So once your heart is right, your legs will work right. So this, it's important that your sins be forgiven. A lot of times folks want a prophetic word but don't want to be told you you're sinning. So if you stop sinning, God will bless you. You don't want to hear that. My prayer line be Zippo. 
Now, he ain't calling out my stuff. I don't want that no because I don't want nobody to embarrass in front of me. And that's true. We're not here to embarrass you or shame you. Amen. Though shame can be a blessing. I'm just putting it out there. There's a lot of promiscuity in the world today. A lot of physical appearances that cause promiscuity, that cause lasciviousness, that cause lust, because nobody had no shame. And if you talk about shame, people feel like you're being critical and judgmental. Yes, we're judging, but not for condemnation, but for correction. There's a difference. I can't put you in heaven, nor can I put you in hell. But I can make an accurate discernment about what I'm seeing. I don't have to incarcerate you and send you to hell, but I can judge poison from Kool-Aid. Amen. And if I choose not to drink that or notice that this smells like poison and this looks like Kool-Aid, that's a proper judgment. That's what discernment is all about. And the word of God is intended to sharpen, somebody say sharpen, sharpen your discernment. How many want discernment? Well, discernment means you judge differently, too. And the scripture goes into the difference and said that as you are able to judge, no one can judge you. Because you're walking in Christ's stead, you're walking in his shadow, so you're judging the Christ in me. And since he can't be judged, you can't be judged. Now, that would be a lot for somebody. So you talk about being perfect. You're talking about being flawless. You're like, you ain't got no mistakes, you don't make no errors, none of those type of things. That's not the implication. The implication is walking holy and righteous consistently with a commitment to perfection, which means maturity. That's what God is calling you to, and your life will be so much better. How many, you, how many want a better life? I don't know why you don't. Amen. Why, why would you not want a better life? Who will sign up for hell and destruction and confusion? You get that for free now. You ain't even got to work hard for that. So it's, it's the will of God that you have Zoe, Z-O-E, the God life. He wants you to have the same kind of life he had, the Zoe type of life. Now, he had stress in his struggles, but that did not stop him from being who he was. Amen. All right. I want to allude to certain things here. I gave you four points. You might want to write them down again, because this is helping you break past spiritual limitations. And I can talk like this because I've broken past some spiritual limitations in a personal life. And these four things I've discovered is find your purpose. Jesus said, for this purpose, the Son of Man. Jesus literally said that. You would think he would know his purpose, but he said, for this purpose means I'm not doing anything extra. I'm doing everything intentional and on purpose. So I know where I'm going. So I ain't got no time for side chicks. Can you say side chicks? I already said it, right? There's other kind of side stuff, too, like collard greens, and corn, those are sides. Potato salad. Second, mac and cheese. Find your people. Actually, that's two sides, mac and cheese. Find your people. Ruth said, my people shall be your people. She gave up culture. She gave up language. She gave up ideas of life to follow after certain things she was not born in. And when I mention this, somebody said, what do you mean find your people? You mean I got to leave the church? Or go to another country, turn to an Italian or African. What does it mean by following your people? I follow this, I elaborate this at another time, but it means find a fellowship. There's a fellowship that is in agreement with you. And a lot of times people think find my people means find a group of people. No, no, no. You can find that right here. Where who you fellowship with, who you connect with on a regular, consistent basis. Maybe one or two people. It don't have to be a great cadre of people. So that's important that you find the right fellowship. Uh, C is find your place. Which is what at the Mount Transfiguration, Jesus said, it is what the disciples said to Jesus when he transfigured and showed his glory. It is good that we be at this place. Because now we see you as you are. But Jesus said, don't celebrate the place because I'm bigger than the place. Don't, don't lock me in to the place. So when they started to put some stones and make a memorial for where he was being transferred, he said, no, no, no. You're going to lock me into the church. And I can't leave the church. So I find my place. My place is with God. I elaborated that another time. Then the last thing is find your power. Find your power. Everyone has an exosia. Everyone has a dunamis. Exosia is authority. Dunamis is ability. 
you have a supernatural authority, you have a supernatural ability to be discovered. I don't care how large or how small, the power of God operates on the inside of you. When you pray, when you say, in the name of, don't hesitate here, this ain't no Muslim meeting. <laughs> in the name of, Jesus. and it said again, Jesus. there's power in that name. So that authority is what you're asking God to answer. Not my authority, but his authority. In the name of the law, in the name of the United States government, in the name of this, in the name of that, in the name of the state. And when you stretch to those names, you're saying the power that's behind those names, that's what's being said, and therefore certain actions and reactions should take place because of what's backing the name. And we call in the name of Jesus. God himself backs up the name. The authority. Every Christian can exercise the authority. That's why the devil leave you alone. Not because you're snotting and crying. Not because you're mad. Not because you're upset. Not because you said it loud or because you whispered. When you say the authority of Jesus, the enemy recognize, recognizes that because he earned his authority through his salvation, through his sacrifice, certain things would take place. Amen? On the day of Pentecost, they got received the power because... They had the authority in Jesus' name to do that. Now, there are certain things in this particular scripture that are metaphors that we can get some instruction for. Like, for instance, was while he was preaching God's word. Stop there and meditate for that moment. While God was talking, people were moving. But while God was talking, also somebody was listening. And this paralyzed man on a mat, you might write down, purpose of the mat. The mat is a limitation. It's a place to temporarily hold you down, hold you back, comforts you, keeps you. It's a temporary place. Unfortunately, sometimes we make our mats into permanent homes. You should have been got up. You should have moved on. I'm thinking about the lame man at the water. He didn't have a mat. Matter of fact, he had an excuse. I would get in the water, but I have no man to help me. In this particular case, this man not only has one man, he got four people to help him. Four people to come to his aid. And these are some ambitious people because not only are they willing to rescue this man, they're willing to take him above the crowd, go up to the roof, tear the roof off. I didn't say sucker. I heard you, though. And lower him down right to where Jesus is talking. I don't want to interrupt the meeting. But their persistency, somebody write that down. Their persistency after hearing God's word gave them a breakthrough. There was a persistency in face of the problem. The problem was too many people in front of me, too many people around me, too many people that Jesus can't see me specifically. I need him to see me, not just hear me. And I hate to be rude, but I'm going to cut in the line because my circumstance and my situation is dire. And I need to get to God. And I've got four people to help me get there. And I gave you four principles to help you get there. There's a reason why I told you find your purpose, find your people, find your, your place, find your That's four people, four spiritual entities that you currently can apply to your life right now. It's four things to look for in the kingdom. Why is four important here? Let me give you some reading here. Four was a sacred and complete number with the Hebrews, as well as several other people. It occurs very frequently in the Old Testament and the New Testament. It indicates completeness. We have four view rivers of paradise, four winds of heaven, uh, four spirits, four winds, four corners of the earth, four quarters of the house, four cities, four kinds. Daniel saw four beasts, four notable horns, four gates, four horns, Zechariah, four chariots and horses, from Zechariah again. Uh, Four living creatures around the throne. That's in the book of Revelation. John saw four angels. Ten times four is 40. 40 years. 40 days. And those numbers imply a time of change. And there are, like I said earlier, four seasons. There are four seasons to your life. This man had four things around him to change his season in his life. And I pray that God send you four systems, four circumstances, four conditions that will show you all these seasons must be lived through. So 
Because folk want to have just one season. Is their blessed season and harvest season, but you have to have all four of them. You can't skip one and just get to the one that you like. Because some people are the summer people, and some people are the winter people. Some people like the spring, some people like the fall. There's a preference you have, but the sun, the moon, and the planet Earth do not care about your, your circumstances. It's not going to stop being what it is because you say, I don't like this weather. And that's what the problem with the men believe is because you're not going to grow to the place that God wants you to be because you keep trying to skip out of seasons and circumstances and situations that maybe God has you through to find another thing more important than getting there. You have to be somebody when you get there. What's important in getting there and you still got the same struggle that you have now? Because your life changed, but your mind didn't change. Your circumstance changed, but your heart didn't change. So this new season and each season has to have completion because after completion takes place, then a new growth. But you're not going to grow as God wants to see you grow. Not on your own terms, not on my own terms, but you're not growing the way God wants you to go through unless you deal with all these different seasons and appreciate and respect the fact that you are. Because the devil got you confessing some things that right now I'm not in my good season. I'm going to beg to differ on that. I might have said that myself at one point. I'll be honest with you. So I'm not trying to belittle your looking for that and the prophet told you this is going to happen. I get it. But don't despise. Because there's a timing that God is doing things about too. Because you and he have to meet at the same place. You're not moving into that new season without him. It's not like you get there and you're happy for what. No, no. First of all, heaven is your home, not earth. Don't get so caught up to this place that you get stuck here, depressed, and die because you don't see natural things taking place right now. God want a grown man, grown woman when you stand in front of him in glory. And all that you've been through, how many have been through some things? God knows how I've been through some things. Yeah, but you've been out of some things too. It ain't always been bad. It ain't always been down. It ain't always been out. And look at you right now. You don't look like what you've been through. Don't get cute with me. All right. All right. Look, you don't look like a nervous breakdown. You don't you say you don't look like a nervous breakdown. You don't say to the Lord, I can't take it no more. How many times you don't told that lie? I mean that's time. You said that. <laughs> I can't take it no more. I understand I've been there, the pressure and all that. Said I've said to the Lord God, how much more? What else I got to do? What else I got to prove? I understand what I get. And see, when God is taking you to them low places, he's getting ready for them high places. Here's what some don't, and I, I think my teacher may throw some people off because they think about prosperity in terms of what shows up in your bank account. It's what's in your heart will reflect what's in your bank account. Your bank account got to follow your heart. You can't let that follow you. You have to, I mean, lead you. You have to allow it to be in its place. And see, God will cause you to be, how can I put this? Broken to be rebuilt. Right. There's, there's a brokenness that all must experience, but that blessing is in the brokenness. And we spend a lot of time avoiding the brokenness. Right. This man is on a mat. Let's go back to the brother that's on the mat. He's on the mat paralyzed. That means all his dreams are paralyzed. All his hopes and aspirations are paralyzed. His income is probably paralyzed. His relationships are all paralyzed because he's limited in how much he can do. But here's a good thing about it. He still wants to get up. Otherwise, he never persisted to have a goal. Somebody say goal. A goal beyond his ability. He just needed an opportunity for his ability to come to pass. He always wanted to get up but didn't know how. Now, all of a sudden, the Lord Jesus comes on the scene preaching a word of faith. Because the Lord said, I see his faith. Did he just now get it? Or when the moment he heard God's word, he started believing. And once he heard God's word, he started believing, things began to change for him. Instead of looking at what he didn't have, he had to look at the situation that would change my life by having persistence and a goal to get to God no matter what. And for some reason, four seasons or four circumstances, four conditions came along in his life that got him to the roof. Now watch this. The goal is not to get to the top. The goal is to get to Jesus. I'll slow it down one more time. Because a lot of folk goal is to get to the top. 
top this, top that, top dog, top cat. Whatever it is, folk want to get to the top because their perception is the top is better. It's fine the better. The top is fine as long as Jesus is there at the top. But if he is not at the top, get to where you got to go. And you must get to where God is. Because they could have stayed on the roof and just heard, heard him. We just stay up here and just listen to him. We don't want to interrupt his message. All right? But they were at a place now. Their faith was itching to see op- uh, 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 access. Their, their faith was itching to see opportunity. Their faith was itching to see manifestation. So they could just hear God's word without saying, well, if you talk like that, show me. If you are who you said you are, then demonstrate that right now. We are silly enough to believe you at your word, that you can do all things. I don't know what he was talking about, but for some reason, it resonated with this man to get to him, and those individuals who helped them get there also had to believe as well. That's why I said find your people, because some folk don't believe your breakthrough. You can't take me to the roof. You won't tear the roof up and let me get on Jesus because you don't think I can walk again. You keep me in a paralyzed state because it makes you feel better about yourself because you're going to walk right by me. But somebody had to take time out of their walking self to help somebody else to get up out of their situation. Those individuals who helped him, you think they're not going to be blessed? Of course they are. They believe God too. They expect it from God too. They didn't just tear that roof off just to simply tear it off. They understood that if this man gets to God, his life is going to change and we want to see a miracle. We want to be a witness to God delivering you. So we're going to put you in front of him and see if he can do what he say he can do. Because you are a good example of what can't be done. Now remember I talked about the mass limitation. The limitation could be racism, sexism, or any other ism that you can come that keeps you stuck on that place where you know God, believe God, but you can't see God active in your life. You know God is real, but I don't see him actively doing what he said he can do. Again, you might not be right around the people, the right people. You might not be in the right fellowship, might not be around the purpose. You may not realize your power. Listen, your power is not always demonstrated in strength. It could just be influence. This man doesn't have physical strength, but he has influence. At least four people convinced to get him up off that roof and bring him down. He had influence. Look, you know how to make people feel sorry for you. You're quite good at it if you want to. Not all of us, but some of us know how to turn that water off and how to turn it off. Some people say one thing to give you a pout. And it's over with. They give you a, a story, and it's over with. And you give yourself, you give this, I'm not going to give it anymore, because some way you being emotionally manipulated, but then you know what's going on. So he was able to influence four people, four circumstances, four situations. And I would go far as it says this. Those four people didn't just show up by accident or mistake. Those are people who came by prayer. And those people showed up to assist him to get to where he needs to go. Even though you're someplace right now feeling by yourself, you don't know who's around that can bless you to get to where you need to go. He had to have ceilings broken. Before he could break a natural ceiling, he had to break a spiritual ceiling, an emotional ceiling, a mental ceiling, and a physical ceiling. That's in number four. A spiritual ceiling, emotional ceiling, a mental ceiling, and a physical ceiling. He had to break all four of them before he got to the, the straw being taken up how many ceilings do you need to break? All four that I just mentioned. Your spiritual ceiling must be broken. Your emotional ceiling must be broken. Your mental ceiling must be broken. Your, phys- your body can't be healed. Now, he got his first ceiling broken because he got his body healed. Then he got his second spiritual ceiling when he said, your sins are forgiven you. That means your spiritual ceiling is broken. You no longer have spiritual limitations on your life. You can pray the prayer of faith and watch me answer you. He didn't have that prior to that. He set a goal to get to God. How many got a goal? Well, no, you ain't because you're black. You know black get back? Brown stick around. No, you have a limitation because you're a female, you're a woman. I'll go on this side because you're acting a little scary. You know, you don't have enough money. You don't have enough degree. You don't have education. You don't have such. I can go down the list of why you feel like you're still on the mat. I'm going down the list of you claiming and confessing that mental mindset that you're stuck somewhere limited based on your current circumstances and that God ain't got no breakthrough. You got to beg him, convince him, or at least he's unfair. He's not treating you fairly. What did I do wrong? And I'm going to come out of this. 
And I understand because you need a healing, not a rebuke for that mental state. It's easy to give you a rebuke and say, don't think like that. Don't, but there's also been some damage. There's been some scars. There have been some wounds. And those wounds are reminding you of certain things. First of all, forgive yourself. Because you made a mistake. You made an error. You may have bad judgment. You did what you shouldn't have done. And you said you weren't going to do it no more. And you lied. Let's just keep adding on to it. First thing he said was, not that you're healed, your sins, which means forgive yourself now. He says, I ain't got nothing against you. What you doing to hold it against yourself? Your background, your history, what you've been stuck in, the choices that you made, the person that you married, the person you didn't marry, who you got pregnant by, who got pregnant, and all that other stuff, your sins. You can't get this breakthrough unless your mind begins to wrap around the fact that God ain't mad at you. God is not looking, waiting for you to break through the ceiling so he can, well, this is why I'm not going to do such and such, so and so. How dare you interrupt my meeting and come through right now? Wow. You have the audacity to interrupt me while I'm talking? Instead of rebuke, I'm thinking, happy to see that. That means you got it. That means you get it. That means you want it. That means you're willing to risk rebuke to get it right. That means at some point in time, your mind got over you. Because you've told yourself things that he didn't say. You said things about yourself that he never thought about you. And you assume because you're thinking that self-talk that he must be thinking it too. It's called projecting. That's why I say God is bigger than me. Thank God. He knows my uprising and my down-sitting. Thank God. He's not surprised by my moving. The moment, the moment I break the ceiling of my mind and keep thinking that God don't want to have nothing to do with me. Then the other thing is this. He's a paralyzed man. What could Jesus use him in the kingdom? How could he use him in ministry? You're stuck being on the mat. Again, the mat is a place, a temporary place. It's not meant to be eternal. Your money ain't meant to be permanent. Your relationship, a lot of things ain't meant to be permanent. So when God is shaking things off your life, and making things take place that you didn't have to get comfortable with because he's trying to get you off that mat. Yeah, you got friends that got you on the mat. So they're helping you up get to the roof. They love, they love you being on the mat. They know exactly where you're at. They don't care. I'm glad you, at least I know where you're at. You won't get in no trouble. That's not the kind of person that's going to lift you up. That's not going to person that's going to take you to the roof. The, all, the, listen, all four of those people said, look, I got problems too. I ain't got time to be lifting you up and take I'm trying to get to him too. What about my concerns? What about my situation? But somebody took the time, and I believe God has somebody assigned. I believe God has four assignments that have an assignment to minister to you. Their assignment is to get you to that place. Not to replace Jesus, but get you to that place that you get in the face of Jesus. That's their assignment just to get you in front of him, and you got to do the rest. But it's a mount, sometimes it's the pastor. Sometimes it's the preacher. Sometimes it's other folks. They're all our job is to get you to that place to get in his face. But sometimes we get caught up on the help and forget who's the divine helper. We're so busy looking at the folk lifting us up, you forgot who answers us so we ain't got to be lifted up like this. If I was you, I would make this confession. This is the last day I'm on the mat. This is the last day. Revelation going to carry me to his face. The word of God is going to carry me to his face. If you notice, Jesus talked to him before he said something to him. Let's go back to that scripture. Seeing their faith. Didn't say seeing his faith. Find your people. We have fellowship with the same kind of faith you have. I remember the first time I went to minister, I got called out to preach for somebody at a primitive Baptist church. And I was just operating my gifts. And uh, of being younger, I was longer-winded, because I was young. I had a lot more wind. <laughs> so a bunch of folk followed me and came to the, I was very glad for the support. But I didn't realize they came to see me fail. I didn't know that till later on. Because they was like, how come he got it and I didn't get it? I don't know. I didn't ask for it. I didn't know I was carrying that jealous spirit with me. 
I had no idea that I, th well, I got support. I got back. I must be all right. I got some kind of charisma. Folk are leading. I had no idea. They just want to be witnesses to my demise. They say, I watched the whole thing. He went down in flames. Didn't know that. So what that verse says, seeing their faith, right? They're in agreement that this man is going to get healed by Jesus. They're in agreement. There's no discussion. There's no debate about why we're here. So find your purpose. They knew their purpose was to get you in his face. They understood his purpose was to get in the face of God. They had a goal with their persistence to break that roof and get in front of him to get him off that mat. Because they realized no matter what medical science said that God had to last say so. And if God said he can get up, he can get up. It was his will. Now, again, I always contrast with the other young man who was paralyzed, that he said, I have nobody to put me in the water. And Jesus approached him. In this case, Christ is being approached. The other case, Christ initiates the contact. But in this case, they initiate the contact. And I always like this about Jesus. You cannot make him be uncool. He's not going to be ruffled by your ex examples. He's just not. He, he's he's going to stay the course. The woman that comes for the baby to be healed, he doesn't do Father, that the, uh, the young girl that's dying, that the woman that's your blood, nobody interrupts his course because he knows his purpose. He's on assignment. He don't get ruffled by distractions. I mean, listen to me. He don't get ruffled by distractions. I plan for this and I pray for that, but all this breaking loose, I quit. We don't know your purpose, you give up quickly. You understand God's plan. It's easy to get distracted and come up with excuses because you're tired or you're afraid or some other thing that you feel inadequate is. It makes you quit because all you need is a distraction. But listen, there's certain things you want to do. You stay focused. There's certain things you want to do. You will stay focused. If you want to go on vacation, I don't care how broke you are. <laughs> By this time tomorrow, I'm in Jamaica. I know rent is due and a car note too and all the other good stuff, but I'm going to lose my mind if I don't get out of the city. And you're going to spend what you ain't got to get there and pray when you get back and ask mama for five more dollars. I just put that out there because somebody said, mama, this is the last time I ain't going to quit no more. This individual has four things to assist him. Let me go back to the metaphor I've been using about seasons. Your four seasons are designed to get you to your destiny and your purpose. You need all four seasons to get into that destiny and purpose that God wants you to be in. I'm going to get a little further with the revelation. <laughs> your faith will increase in such a manner that if it storms in your season, you can speak to your storm in your season and say, peace be still in that season. And the season that said it's raining will not stop you from reaching your destination on the other side of the shore. And that's why the Lord is frustrated with them because they forgot who he is and who they are and they let the weather, the season, change your direction. He's upset because they're looking at the natural and they forgot about the spiritual. They gave their power over to the natural and forgot to exercise the power within them and also laying there. They keep on asking for something outside of them and God said, look at you. Don't let the storm change you off your course. It's going to rain in your season. So what? Be a duck. That's right. You got to let it roll right off you. You know how ducks are? I love ducks. Ducks are smooth. On the surface, they cool. Donald with Donna, just chilling going across the lake. Effortlessly. You ever see how ducks cross the water? It's just effortlessly. Right, but beneath that water, <laughs> them little feet is moving. You can't tell by their face, but beneath their feet, their feet are just churning back and forth. Your prayer life and your natural life may not look the same. You look cool on the outside, but you're praying up a storm underneath it. They have no idea how much you're praying, but listen, you're making progress. You're getting where you're supposed to go. And your neighbor may say, look like she ain't got no trouble. Look like he ain't never got a bad day. You have no idea. I'm just a duck. <laughs> Amen. 
You have no idea. My feet is moving while we're talking. And see, the reason why I'm not looking crazy is because I'm looking straight ahead where I got to go. So I got time to be paying attention to this. Plus, I'm covered with the oil. You know, ducks emit an oil to make them float. Ain't you got the Holy Ghost? The oil of what? If you're covered in the oil, you ain't going to drown. You ain't going to drown. That's what I said. You're going to make it. Quack, quack. You're not going to quack up or quack down. You're going to make it. And the enemy wants you to confess that this circumstance, this situation, which is temporary. God had a plan to get this man off this mat the entire time. If he, he was ready for him. He was no surprise. He was ready for him, just like he's ready for you. When you come out your bankruptcy, when you come out your divorce, when you come out your separation, when you come out your unemployment, when you come out your health challenges, whatever it is, stage three, stage four, whatever it is, God has been waiting on you. You're not, you're not interrupting him. You're not throwing him off his course of what he's talking about. He's focused. Matter of fact, you're the results of what he's talking about. Let's go back to back Mark, Mark 2. While he was preaching, that's what the scripture said. While he was preaching, means in the midst of God talking, somebody start believing. Faith come by hearing, hearing by. Amen. The Lord got so disappointed many times when he said this. Oh, you of evil gentlemen, how long must we wrong you? Because of unbelief. That irritated Jesus. Unbelief. But faith made him happy. Faith made him excited. And any time he saw faith, he never turned it down, no matter how it got to him. He never turned it away. The moment he saw faith, he jumped on it like a thirsty person because he didn't see a lot of it. And when he saw somebody believe in him and taking him at his word and expecting him not just to tilt that thing, but also do the things that he said he could do, it made the Lord happy. He's excited. Why? Because he made you, and you don't look like what he made. He didn't make a paralyzed man. He made a walking man. So how dare my creation come in here and look in front of me, not what I made it to be. Acts talks about in the ninth chapter, he healed all those who were sick that were oppressed of the devil. He had a vendetta. He had a mission. Anything that didn't line up and look like what he said it to be, because his word can't come back void, includes you. And the word that's been spoken of, you can't come to Jesus looking like that. Looking like this? The plan of God is bigger than what you perceive for yourself. And when you stand in front of God looking like other than what he said, but don't line up with his will, he ain't going to go your way. How many have been convicted before? I'm convicted now, prophet. What you talking about? <laughs> for the last 20 minutes. Come on, how many of y'all been convicted? My God, how much more can you take? Well, that means you're healthy. That means God loves you. And that you and God got it going on. It's not comfortable, but you have a relationship. And the context is you and God in the same place, in the same space. The only thing that's causing conflict is your mind and his mind are not lining up. So that's where the conviction comes in. The conviction is correct your thinking so you and I can walk in agreement. How can two walk together except they agree? So that conviction is, hey, that sounds good, but get over here. Because your conviction is going to determine your connection. And if you're connected to the wrong thing because you ain't convicted, that's why some are half crazy and always crazy right now. Because you wasn't convicted. You made some bad choices, some bad decisions that didn't convict you. Amen. You let the lips just run off at the mouth. You said what you wanted to say, you did what you wanted to say, with no conviction of consciousness. Amen. It's a relationship, folks. All right, in a relationship, your spouse may look at you with an eye like, hey, I'm just going to let that marinate for a minute. You can act all big and tough at the party, but when we get home, <laughs> that sounds good at church, but when we get home, all right, and in your heart, there's a conviction that later on, a correction is coming. And the conviction comes because I'm challenging the value of this relationship. And I'm dismissing the value of this relationship or putting it aside. So if I enjoy the value of this relationship and I don't want to lose it, the conviction says, is it worth it? 
Is it worth losing this relationship that you worked so hard to build? You're trespassing against the barriers and the borders of your relationship that protect you and keep things from getting in as versus letting things out. Because you keep thinking that God's trying to stop you from getting the things. Maybe he's stopping things from getting to you. Listen, I'm going to put it like this. You don't know how attractive you are. Some of us say, yeah, I know, Pastor. I might have a clue based on my responses I'm getting on Instagram. <laughs> I might be, I got more friends than you know, bro. So I think I'm attractive enough. No, I'm not talking about being attractive in a carnal, in a natural, in a physical way. I'm not just talking about spiritual, I mean, beauty. we're talking about your ability to attract God. Do you understand that God want to look at you too? It ain't just you looking at him. He want to look at you too. But are you viewable? Yes, I just want to know. I want to look at you too. I want to enjoy how you look too. All right, when Adam wakes up from his sleep and see Eve, he's attracted to her. He likes how she looks and she likes how he looks. And they bond and have children. God wants to look at you and understand you in the context. That's why he looks you. He puts you in Jesus. So every time he sees you, he sees Jesus. And when you confess and repent, you're in Christ. Therefore, there's no condemnation because God don't mind looking at you. Understand this. God can love you, but he ain't got to like you. Oh, wait a minute. God is love. Love and like are two different things. You love your children, but sometimes you don't like their ways. There are a lot of blood relatives that you love them, but you just don't like their ways. You like your mama and your daddy. I can't stop with one. I can't pick out which big heads you got, both of them. I, I, don't, I don't like your behavior. It offsets all the other things about you. That's why he demands holiness. Holiness is not so you can't have fun. You can't do this. You can't do that. You can't go this. You can't go this. It's not about that. It's about can I be attracted to you and touch you and talk to you without being offended by you? Can I, can I have a connection with you without offense by your behavior, by your attitude, with a haughty look, a proud look? That's why he loves the humble, because the humble recognize and realize who they are. A couple of weeks ago, I listened to this young man sing. I didn't know it was a man singing. And he was singing a beautiful song. It was a beautiful worship song. And the instructor asked us, about what we thought about the song, and I, just, I don't think I mentioned this before. I said, well, I, I, a lot of folks gave great answers, wonderful answers. Somebody said, I saw colors. I saw, they were singing a worship song, beautiful praise and worship song. When I listened to the song, I was hearing the spirit of this person, and I said, this reminds me of Billie Holiday, which is a blues. And the reason why I said Billie Holiday, because she was talking a song about strange fruit. She was talking about people being hung on a tree during the time of Jim Crow. That's what the song is about, the strange fruit of people hanging on a tree. But she sings it in a melancholy way. Now, melancholy don't have to be sad, but it invokes sadness. So I heard this person singing a gospel song with that melancholy in their voice. Now, here's a wonderful thing. They had all kinds of runs, all kinds of risks, but they were so caught up in the presence of the Lord that they dared not use their gift and talent to try to impress God. Though they wanted to. But they had to recognize the fact that what I'm trying to impress God with, he gave me in the first place. So how dare I take ownership of something like his mind when I realize it's his all together? So I am tentatively want to share something with him, but the same token I realize I ain't got nothing to give him but this. So all I can do is just give him what they told me, but every time he wanted to express something in his voice, I can feel him pulling back. I can hear the person pulling back. And the melancholy was the deliverance and the regret of deliverance, and the regret of deliverance trying to take the place of the fact that you are delivered. So don't spend too much time in regret. That's selfish. Release the regret so you can enjoy the release. And if you want to give God honor, stop living in regret and start looking in release. Though he appreciates the fact that you are sad about it, that's one thing, but now it's time to move on. He's not looking at your past. He's looking at your present. So as much as you want to wallow in it one more time and tell God how this and how this, he let him listen. If I bless you and I freed you, prove it. Live it. Demonstrate it. If I bless you to be free from things that had you in bondage, don't keep rehashing the past. 
I understand you want to remember to stay humble, but don't let that humble place become your locked in place. Prove it to me by being fruitful, not barren anymore. That's why I saw the melancholy, because this person singing had the challenge of how do I minister to God what God has been ministering to me? And since God has ministered to me, I ain't got nothing to do but just stand here. And I thought I was all that, because I can impress man, I can impress people, I can get you to jump and shout, get out your seat. But I'm in his presence, the author and finisher of my voice. Not just my faith, my being, my understanding, my thinking. He is an author and finisher of all things. How dare I, at the same time, dare you? Sing anyhow, not because you're supposed to. Sing because he designed you to do that and because you're off course, but thank God you're back on course. So give him praise anyhow. What do you mean? Give him praise anyway, harlot, ex-harlot, liar, deceiver, cheater, thief. Give him praise anyhow. Why? Because I'm not that person anymore. Yes, that stays on your resume, but God has took the blood of Jesus and wiped your name clean. Stop reading the book of your past, start reading the book of your future. It's not where you was, but where are you now? I'm in your presence. Well, shut up and give me glory. Be still and know that I'm God. And see, sometimes saints get stuck like that. Don't know what to do. Don't let yourself go enough to let God keep doing what He's going to do because the enemy in your flesh keeps reminding you, and you think you're doing God a service, it keeps you humble. It's not faith. It's not faith. It's facts, but it's not faith. Faith is hope that you ain't seen yet. The evidence. And God wants to see the evidence that what you're hoping for is going to come to pass. Not the fact that you, He know you've been through. You understand why your head nappy? And you ain't happy? You understand why your clothes is frayed and your money? He understand all that. He got all of that. I'm talking to the white people too. <laughs> it's not a racial thing. <laughs> so you may not be nappy, but you sure ain't happy. Amen. But <laughs> Why is God doing these things? Why is the Lord doing those things? I want to, here's a thought. Write this down. I will read my verbatim notes. We often suffer ignorant of our own significance. We fall prey to the illusion that our lives don't matter. We have no connection or impact on the world around us. We often suffer ignorant of our own significance. Right? We, fail, we fall prey to the illusion that our lives don't matter and we have no connection or impact on the world around us. That man on the mat could have said that. What am I? A crippled man on the mat. You know, it says to me going to Jesus for what? To give me a hope that it will happen, I won't walk again. If I walk with him, I thought I ain't been trained about 40 years. I don't know how to do a skill or whatever. I've been on the mat. So how useful am I to Christ if I get up off this mat? I'm going to give this to myself. He's failing to see his significance. And God didn't look at him and go, no, nah, you're not qualified because of this and because of your background. Because God did not look at him and disqualify him because you told you you ain't significant. You said that. And that's not humility. That's actually pride. And you're looking at yourself in a context that God ain't looking at you. So who's got, who you going to believe? Whose report besides about yourself in the word of God versus what you think about yourself? Because you tell yourself a lot of things that God didn't tell you. As recently as right now. Right. And you don't see it. You don't understand it. You don't comprehend it. Because you're assuming, well, because of my past, I mentioned about the person saying, because you're thinking this, this, let go. Don't you say that? Let go and let what? Do you really mean that? Or is it a nice thing to say? Let go and let God. What, fire my boss who's getting on my nerve? That's what you mean, let go and let God slap somebody. <laughs> strike him dead, Jesus, strike him dead. Let go and let God get you. Will you stop sticking Jesus on people? Get him, Lord, get him. Such not my anointed. Yeah, I get it. I understand that the threat harass you and try you, but humility is power and reserve. 
which means I do have the power to strike back, but I choose not to. Oh, this is the challenge right now because self-preservation is always kicking in. Reputation is always kicking in. The world right now is all about reputation. Being seen, and being heard, being understood, and being able to influence, it's all about reputation. Cancel culture, or cancel whatever you want to call it, is about no more having a reputation that's viable, that's useful, that's financially stable, or anything else that people like you. Nobody wants to get canceled because my reputation is the issue. Now, this is going a little bit deep, and if you want to leave the church right now, that's fine. I'm going to keep on talking like this. I can talk to these chairs. I'm fine with it. In Philippians chapter 2, it says he became a no reputation. That's the scripture. But people want to be like Jesus, but when you get to that part, the bishop don't know how to act. The prophet don't know how to act. The apostle don't know how to act. I ain't an apostle. I ain't no bishop. I ain't no. I'm not this. Well, and some folk want elevation by promotion, but God got a promotion, so you just stay there. And you may go through, how, how many have had situations where you felt like your reputation was being sullied, that folk was not respecting you? Where was the Lord Jesus Christ declaring how anointed you was while folk were doing them type of things to you? Why he didn't give you a mumbling word to say some kind of crew to get out of that circumstance this way? How come he didn't even give you a hint? Hmm? Where was it? May not come when you want him. <laughs> and he ain't even on time right now as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> It's been time. <laughs> My reputation's at stake. Oh, that's very, very scary because you worked hard to get to your reputation. Amen. You walk on water. Both your shoes are goody. That's why they two of them. Goody, two. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You know what the worst thing a saved person can hear is you ain't saved. Worst thing a saved person can hear is you a hypocrite. A real saved person does not want to be noted as an unsaved person. A real loved glory, born again child of God does not want to be told you a hypocrite. Say amen, five people. Now I'm not saying it happened, but if it happened, it would be a problem. Because you worked hard and long to prove your faith and your walk with God. Now here comes somebody disparaging that or taking less of that. What are you supposed to do about that? You don't know who I prayed for. You don't know how fast I for. You don't know how much money I gave. You don't know what I did. And folks may not look at your resume, but look in the moment, and it calls you these type of things, and you were saying, what is going on? It's called promotion season. Promotion season? Folk disparaging me and not celebrating me and not elevating me? I'm around more haters and helpers. How do I survive this season of God letting all the haters loose? Be inundated with them. And one thing about it is some of them haters you helped. How dare you hate me while I'm helping you? You gonna take my stuff and talk about me too? Because you think you're helping them, they feel entitled to what you think you're helping them with. It's not about your help, it's about, your, it's about time you caught on and recognize and realize what you're supposed to. <laughs> your perception is they're going to humble them like it would humble you, but they ain't you and you ain't them. If you find that they don't respond the way you want them to respond, it's because you're in a season of promotion. What do you mean promotion? This don't feel good. No. God is telling you, can you handle glory that ain't yours? Because the way I'm going to work in you, folk going to look at you, and if they're not careful, they're going to see me so evident in you that they might think you are me. I want to operate in you in such a manner that it won't be distinguished the two of us. So let's get it clear from jump. Who gets to carry the glory? Sing that song, fill my cup. Right, well, we already got to clean the cup. Nobody wants to drink out of a dirty cup. Then we got to make sure the cup can handle what we're about to pour into it. Make sure that it's the kind of cup that can handle the thing that's about to be poured into it. And then Jesus said, can this cup be passed? Because he's about to go to the cross. Reputation's at stake. He's being crucified because his reputation is not good. 
Galatians 2.20 is a real circumstance. And I'm only talking to grown folk. I'm talking to spiritual people growing. The Lord's telling me to challenge you to come on up. Grow on up. I get it. The prophet's in the building. I can say some things for you. That's a blessing to you. But the thing is, the prophet is a prophet because of the way I'm thinking like this right now. God's not going to use me if I don't get out his way. And not just Sunday. Sunday is easy. Put your best Sunday clothes on. You talk a different kind of way. Sunday is easy. Monday morning. Is it the leftover saint? You know, it's, it's a fresh baked saint on Sunday, but leftover on Monday. By Tuesday, throw it in the garbage. Can you stay fresh like you are today, tomorrow? Can you be spiritually fresh to tomorrow, Tuesday? And can you be consistently, or are you still in an up and down roller coaster moment? And see, God wants you to go in a place of consistency. Why? Because he's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. So if two are going to walk together in agreement, you've got to be as consistent as he. That don't mean that you have to keep up with him, but trust him to make you keep up with him. And that's going to come with some challenges. And if he sees certain things about to take place, your steps which are ordered by the Lord may go into places that you don't find comfortable nor convenient. You may go into places where you're not being celebrated. Amen. Something had to die in Ruth's life to get to a place that she could say, your people will be my people. Why? Because her people are dead. She's an orphan. She has no connection to her past. Now she's got to start giving for her future because her past is no longer there. She's got to submit to a situation where she's going to be overwhelmed. She's the underdog. She's a minority. And she's got to accept all those different terms to get to where God wants her to be. You've been in places you ain't want to be there. You're the only one. You're the only somebody there. That's your job. That's your house. You're the only somebody there. You ask God, why you got me here? <laughs> what am I supposed to do here? I ain't got nobody there. Talk to you for a minute, Rufy. And Rufus, for the dudes. <laughs> right. It's just a season. This too shall pass. It's just a season. And see, God is planting certain things in your life in that season that match that particular season. And certain times that season calls for you to do nothing and let the leaves fall. That's reputation. My prosperity, my greenness. Brown and drying up. Wow, look at this. Wow. I'm naked. I got nothing to cover me from the protection of the weather. All my prosperity gone. Is it? Hmm. You're forgetting something. The leaves are the results of the root. The root's still there. The leaves are the results of the limb. The limb is still there. You're looking at the leaf, and you ain't looking at your limb. You ain't looking at your, your branch. You ain't looking at your. You ain't looking at all this other stuff that make you, because you're looking at a fruit or a leaf that you lost in a season that's about to regrow again. And if you don't prune it, yeah. things have to be pruned. Don't take pruning for punishment, because sometimes you think pruning is punishment because God taking something from you. No, he ain't taking nothing from you. He's taking the things that's going to take toxicity, that's going to put toxins in the other parts of you. That's for pruning. If you want the quality fruit. You want the good fruit, you got to give it to the bitter stuff. And sometimes the bitter stuff comes because you got too much going on. That ain't got nothing to do with your purpose or future. You got too many things that are added to your life that you ain't got. It's cluttering up your perspective. It's cluttering up your goals. So God got to shape you up. Let's get rid of some things. What are my favorite Converse and my favorite sneakers? I like that hat. I got that hat back in such and such, so and so. I like that t-shirt. I got this. You got these memorial things. You got these souvenir things that you want to hold on to. And God said, eh. Can, you know me, can I, I must be myself here. There's an episode of Martin where him and Gina get married. Come on, you got BET. <laughs> and both of them start sneaking stuff. They're supposed to be getting rid of it so they can move in the apartment. <laughs> he got sneakers, she got things. They all got, they both, and they finally just bust out and show everything they got. They got stuff in the freezer, they got stuff in the refrigerator. They holding on, both of them lying each other. And only thing God is getting rid of you in your life is anything that competes with him. There's nothing in your life that he's taking out your life that he, he don't mind. He doesn't mind you having anything as long as that thing ain't him. That's all it is. You can have whatever you want to have. The earth of the Lord is in the fullness thereof. That's not his problem. 
It's not what's loving you, it's what you loving back. And if it's got your attention, thou shalt have no other gods before me. I'm a jealous God. And the jealous come out of concern, not of insecurities. I'm concerned that you're attached to death. You understand the Holy Ghost grieves? We always talk about the Holy Ghost make you shout, the Holy Ghost make you dance, but he cries. Can you imagine crying? Because grief is a form of death. Something is dying. And we sin and do what we do. We're moving our flesh from destiny, and the Holy Ghost cries that you're losing, and you're choosing something that's lying to you, that's going to let you die. And I'm crying because my heart is broken that you're missing out on your blessing by deception and decision making. Now, the Holy, can you imagine the Holy Ghost crying over you? Because we think about Holy Ghost convicting you, but think about him also crying. Because he knew what he prophesied to you, that's about to die. It's about to be a eulogy. You've got a headstone already for your purpose because you're about to kill it. And the Holy Ghost said, look, look, this was the future I had planned for you. I know my thoughts concerning you. I know my plans concerning you. And there's things that's happening right now that's not concerning you. And I see you going to a place called death, which is a separation from me. So I'm dying, not because of your sin. I'm crying over you, missing the fact that I want you here when you're trying to go there. That's love. That's love. Well, maybe you understand what I'm saying. You didn't want to break up, and he said, it ain't you, it's me. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, you said that to him. <laughs> Let me change the whole narrative. I had it all mixed up in my mind. Who was I thinking? You let them go. What was I thinking? <laughs> it ain't you, it's me. I understand. And so you can tell God that. It's not you, Lord. I love you, but it's me. I need my space, and I want to see other people's. <laughs> In this context, other purpose, other options, other dreams, other visions, other techniques, other ability, anything other than the plan of God has now become your lover and got your attention. So God is grieving. Have you watched a friend make a poor decision? You ever see a person in a relationship where their heart is so caught up in it that they can't see what's in front of them? They will sooner or later, but right now they can't see it. And their hearts and their minds are so caught up in what they're trying to see and what they're trying to believe. Forget about the red flags. Stuff is on fire. It's gasoline on it. You still can't smell the smoke. But that's your friend, and you can't say that on your relationship, and you can't tell them, because, even if you try to tell them they're going to hate you for being a hater, and not help me, just like you, not to approve of me. All of that sometimes is what God is with you. I'm not hating on your happiness. I'm not happy, hating on your joy, your purpose. But you're dealing with a devil that's trying to destroy you by telling you lies that you want to hear and not telling you the truth that you need to hear. And when you hear the truth sometimes, it ain't pleasant, nor is it pretty, but truth blesses you, it frees you. You know how to work with the right context. You don't have to go by false premises. You can now put your faith and your confidence in the reality of God's truth based on the facts that he said it, I believe it, and that settles it. But that won't happen unless God gives you some revelation about you. Not them. Because you want God to expose them, Jesus. Expose them, Lord. Let's go back to that verse again. That's not my nor do my father. Why don't you put, touch not my boyfriend and leave me alone. <laughs> touch not my girlfriend and leave me alone. Something like that. Go ahead and be real. Stop trying to make it all spiritual. Let's just be for real. And, and see, the Spirit of God has a blessing for you. And again, let me get to this verse. I'm, I'm taking too much time here. I don't want to bore you. Mark chapter, I want to read this verse again because there's some things in it that are rich. And sometimes I skip over things. Mark, while he was preaching, God's word to them for purpose, people, place, and power found him. Four seasons arrived carrying a paralyzed man temporarily on, you can't get worse than paralysis. I can imagine the fact of feeling paralyzed and a mind still functioning, a mind still thinking, a mind still operating because your body's not functioning, I mean your mind's are operating. But the problem is you don't want your brain to become paralyzed like your body. You don't want your heart, your spirit to become paralyzed by your circumstance and your situation. They couldn't bring him to Jesus because of the crowd. 
You can't get the bank loan because you're black. You can't get it because you're a woman. You can't get this or that because of that. I can put a bunch of things in the crowd that's in front of you right now. Pastor got favorites. I've been trying to get used in the kingdom, but the man of God got somebody in front of him that's fake and it's phony and witches probably. The same token he can't see. Open his eyes, Lord, so he can see them witches. I'm sorry, I had to go there for a few seconds. It's another church I'm talking about, not ours. <laughs> Quit lying, boy. <laughs> Note to self. <laughs> they could not bring him to the Lord because of a crowd. That's a reason. Legitimate reason. Paralysis, crowd. No brainer. Let's go back another time. Let's get back another day. Let's see him another time. Here's a problem. You're not prioritizing your deliverance. You don't have persistence because you ain't got a priority of you getting off that mat. You, you can come up with creative ideas and creative thoughts. And cre now, he did not pray the Lord to open a ward for him. He didn't ask God to open up a door for him. You won't see any prayer on his behalf that's saying, Lord, make a way out of no way. Help me get through the crowd. The woman with the issue of blood, she didn't pray like that either. She simply, she's in a crowd too. Many circumstances where folk are more than you. And sometimes you feel insignificant. Like I quoted earlier, in your own mind, you think you can't get to God because of the things that's in your way. There are all kinds of things that's in my way. But hello way. I know who is the way, the truth, and the life. And his word cannot come back void. He didn't lie to me. When he told me to come on up to see him, I'm coming to see him. Now apparently, the way I imagined it was going to happen ain't happening the way I imagined it to happen. You ever have your imagination not match up with reality? You want certain things to happen a certain way, the way you dreamed it, the way you prayed for it, the way the prophet told you. But where does crowd come from? Where's all these limitations that come in front of me? How in the world am I supposed to get to where God wants me to be when so many things are blocking me from getting there? What am I supposed to do about this? Hmm. Now we need priority, not just prayer. And see, a lot of folk will pray, but not with priority. And you don't pray with persistence. You pray, and uh, God heard me. Crowd is in front of me. Body is lame. Might as well go on back home. Huh. I'm getting up today. He determined his season was going to change that day. The circumstance and the conditions and the issues did not phase him enough to say, this is a good, and it's probably on paper, a good logical reason to say this ain't a good time to see the Lord. He's actually talking. You got a crowd of people. And if it ain't my house. I'm about to tear somebody else out to get to Jesus. I don't know what in the world going to happen I'll tear somebody's house up. But I'm willing to risk it all. Why? Because God's purpose on me is greater than my problem. And I'm going to prioritize getting, if he's talking the right talk, then I can walk the right walk. So therefore, I'm going to persist and have a priority of getting to him. You've had some heartbreak. You have to get persistent past your heartbreak. You've had some letdowns. Some folk who promised you things did not come through. You have to be persistent and prioritize your purpose. Your purpose ain't got nothing to do with people. It's between you and God. And some of you get stuck on what people are doing to block your purpose. I'm trying to stay all the way safe. I don't want to let that little carnal man come in here. Because in my mind, I want to say, I wish a certain thing would, would, but I ain't going to say that. But I truly would want to say that. I ain't going to lie to you. Yeah, my persistency has come from the frustration. And the fuel of frustration has been redirected, not to failure, but to faith. Feel like the energy of frustration abort my mission, abort God, and forget God. Huh. What I got to lose? I'm already paralyzed. What I got to lose? I'm already stuck. What do I have to lose by believing God regardless? In spite of, I can't get this close to the word of God like you are now, and not come away with God not doing what he said he can do in that word. I can't get this close in vicinity and proximity and not experience the power of God delivering me from my position. I can't listen to God and dismiss it and go, all these things in front of me. He knew it was going to be a crowd outside. He knew I couldn't walk in on my own. 
but he ain't stopped talking. He ain't stopped preaching. He didn't tailor make the message for me. He kept on saying what he was saying. And guess what? I'm about to bust in, Jesus. I'm, I'm coming in. And I'm coming through. I'll pay for the roof later. But right now, I need to get to Jesus. Right? And the word of God says he literally landed right in front of his face while he's talking and preaching. Listen, I'm a pastor. I'm a preacher and a minister sometimes, like I want to be. And I don't want to be interrupted while I'm talking. Most sermons, your folk don't get interrupted. But in this context, he's interrupted. Why? Because you've got to understand something. God is a God of results and not just rhetoric. And a lot of folk do a lot of rhetoric, but no results. They talk a lot, but they have no results. They have no proof in their pudding. So therefore, if you interrupt them, all they got is a dissertation. All they got is a little talk. They got gesticulate, but no articulation. They can talk all day long, but they ain't got no proof in the pudding. And when the Lord Jesus sees people, wants, you want to see proof? Gotcha. I'm so glad you came on in. I'm so glad that you pushed past your limitations. I'm so glad you pushed past your barriers. I'm so glad that you pushed past things that are supposed to slow you down and stand in front of me because you apparently believe me in spite of what's going on and what's probably taking place. How many believe God this morning? Yeah, because I got a room full of limitations. Those are the people watching me. There are a room full of people. This and on, I can't even imagine how many people on social media. You have limitations. Everybody does. Don't fool yourself. Folk put on a great front and make you think like everything is fine. But behind closed doors, there's so many mental breakdowns, emotional breakdowns, spiritual breakdowns. The reason why some are on the mat right now, because you walked at one time. You walked the walk and you talked the talk. But what put you on the mat? What got you laid out? And I perceive that some of that is because you misunderstood your seasons. You didn't know your place, didn't know your purpose, didn't know your power, didn't know your people. And before you know it, you've been laid out in some tradition, some religion, they ain't got no power, and now you still like the rest of them. And you hear sermon after sermon, every Sunday after Sunday, sermon after sermon, but you still ain't got up off your mat. You're still stuck in that place called stuck. But here's the thing. Why are you hearing this word like this now? What's the date? Of what? What year? At what time? This is a Kronos and Karyos moment taking place right now. It ain't happening tomorrow. It's not happening next week. We're talking about even in this now, God moment is moving for you even now. Now, you may not feel the goosebumps and adrenaline that you wouldn't have to confirm that you hear what I'm saying. Listen, but your faith is leaping and your faith is expecting and you believe in God to do some things that you could not possibly do before. And it's not necessarily contingent upon me. Forget me. If my faith don't match your faith, find somebody who have match your faith and get past this little person faith or this big person faith. Get the faith that God has. But you're trying to move God, not move people. And God said, don't take much to move me. Just believe. This man did not quote one Bible verse that I know of to say, Lord, you got to heal me. He just showed up. He let his condition speak for him. You see what's going on. Do I say anything? Do need I say anymore? Look at yourself mentally, emotionally, psychologically, and you're not the person that you want to be, and you're falling apart, and you're standing from the Lord. He looks at you. You don't have to diagnose. You ain't got to be a prophet to discern nothing. Just look at you. And when God sees you not looking like him, Oh, things are going to change. Well, he don't see it reflected in you. And that's why he said your sin is forgiven. What's the sin? You didn't believe me. You ain't had to lie. You ain't got to steal. You just didn't believe me. You didn't trust me. You didn't understand me. You ain't got to do negative things or obnoxious things. Just the fact that you didn't believe. You know how many times you justify your sin because you confess that you don't believe God? You may not say that, but your actions demonstrate that. But God is saying in this particular context that now that you believe me, your sins are forgiven because you expect me to be the God of this Bible. How many expect God to be the God of this Bible? Now, this is weird thinking because somebody said, well, we can't live back in Bible days. Culturally, you're correct. We cannot live culturally like we did back then. We got running water and flushing toilets. 
That's a big deal. You might be surprised. Hygiene and sanitation involved with getting rid of that kind of stuff. All kinds of diseases could take place if you can't get rid of waste. Plumbing systems, the things that you take for granted, even lights. Folks had to use candles and garrison one time. Got lights, nobody think twice about it. How I many you know, my brother match, did you? So we good. Even air conditioning and heat, things that we enjoy in America. Some countries don't even have these kind of, they're common things that we enjoy all day long, don't think nothing about it. That's called common providential grace. That's a form of providence. Well, God's not influencing you directly, but it rains on the just and the unjust, which means God is blessing everybody, anybody under the sun, whether they believe him or not. That's providential grace. But then there's specific grace that God has for the believer. There's a grace that God has for you. Let us approach the throne of grace boldly with confidence, having help in the time of need. I don't have to beg when I can believe God. And not the throne of judgment and negativity, but the throne of grace. Favor, charis, charisma, come in front of me, Lord, and get the gifts I have in store for you. What's got you stuck? It's time for you to get unstuck. Now, I'm not going to lose a lung and a tonsil trying to pray the prayer of faith over you. Plus, my tonsil's been gone since I was 12, so there's a problem right there. So what are you talking about, Pastor? It's up to you and you and God to walk this thing together. It's up to you. You have to decide, I want to get off the mat of insecurity. I want to get off the mat of, of unfulfillment. I want to get off the mat of missing my appointment. And just, I want to get off this mat of break, break down. I want to get off this knee blocking me thing. There's a limit off of me. Spiritually, mentally, emotionally, and physically. Pastor somebody say, I'm getting up. I'd go one step further, and I'm not taking no for an answer. I, I'm not taking no for an answer. You have no no in your promises. You said in your own word, all your promises are yea. So I'm ready to cash in my coupons. The Bible says, redeem the times so the days are short. On your coupon, I say, redeem these things before such and such a time. Otherwise, they won't be effective, which means get paid. You get paid correctly and right. It is a season for somebody to get paid. I can't talk like this without authorization. I can't speak like this unless God is saying this is the time to move like this. I cannot address this. I'm pastor, prophet, pastor, preacher. It's right to teach all that right now. It's going at the same time. But it's something that somebody's watching me or somebody's hearing me right now. You need to hear this. You may not hoop now, but you'll hoop at the dealership. Yeah, you ain't got to hoop here. You'll hoop at closing. How about that? Yeah, don't, don't save all your hoop for here. Take some of that hoop home with you. Take your holler, take your shout down to where you believe in God for, and let the Lord know everywhere I plant my foot. So you ain't got to holler here. I know a lot of hollering for in the church that stay broke when they get home. Amen. Shout out at the dealership. <laughs> No, nah, we cool. We good. You ain't bad at all. We good. Don't, don't worry, but you good with me. But that was the right cue. The only issue is, it's the wrong location. If I can get you to come down to Mercedes with me, then we can talk. I'm being carnal for a second, materialistic for just a second, but this will make the point. If you can follow me on down to the dealership, and before I sign papers, you in the background, play it again. Stop. We're trying to negotiate a deal. <laughs> and the man asked me, Mr. Brian, you understand we're the down payment. Well, who are these people with you? Are these your co-signers? This is my praise team. They just co-signing on my face. They co sign on my belief in God. They're like Jehovah, Jeremiah before, that I'm giving praise before I get to the walls. 
You brought a praise team with you? Why not? You're going to bless me anyway. You understand it's a real to offer. I understand all that. This ain't church. I get all that too. What did I say? The earth is the Lord, the fullness is the earth. And yet, will I praise him? I brought a praise team to remind me and you. When my credit can't get it, God got it for me. And when people are saying things about me negative, God still got it for me. And as you turn me down, me and my praise team going to move on. We ain't going to stay stuck and sad and mad. No, we've been down that path. We've been down the sad, depressed. We ain't going in no more. We ain't going that feel bad, feel sorry no more. We off the mat. We ain't on the mat no more. That's why we had to deal with it, because you can't drive a mat. We're here because we got off of that. And we're ready for the next level. How many ready for the next? Y'all ain't saying nothing to me. How many ready for that next? I'm not trying to get you emotionally, psychologically souped up and psyched up. No, this is a week I decree and declare unto you in advance. Oh my God. I speak a word into your life before your life gets to a place where you don't even like you've got no life. That thus saith the Lord in the name of Jesus. The losing part of you is over and the winner is about to rise up. Listen, you got enough power, you ain't seen what kind of power you got. That's the only thing. If you can get the blindness off your eyes, the power always been there. The people always been there. The promise and the purpose has always been there. You just weren't looking in the right direction. But the Holy Ghost is telling me to tell you this morning, change your perspective, you're going to change your position. Somebody give God praise right now. I don't know where you're going, but you're getting out of this. I don't know how long it's going to take, but you're getting out of this. I, you know what? I almost feel like it's New Year's Eve. Like today feels like the first of January. For somebody. Oh, stop, 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 stop. I'm, I'm almost finished. Yeah, bro. Did you shave? Look mighty smooth. Let me say something about this. Four is the fourth day God caused all creation to be done. That's the number of creation. It's 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 the number of creation. And understand this, it's the number of material creation. All the material things that God was going to put on the planet, he created on the fourth day. He finished putting all the things that he was going to create, then he pulled man from the dirt, but that was later on. But all the material things was in place. What's missing in your life material-wise? How many getting something out of what I'm saying right now? Are you grabbing a hold of what I'm sharing with you this morning? Maybe you don't get all of it, but something is resonating with you. Something is still ringing. Something is holding on. You're still thinking about something I said 20 minutes ago. That's where the Holy Ghost is having a meeting right now. That moment where you heard about 10 minutes ago when I first started, your brain is still there, wondering about it. elaborate more, elaborate. That's between you and God later on. And you sit down with the Lord and say, listen, I gave a, a couple hours of my precious time. And I can't get them times back. If that man was telling me the truth, I didn't see some evidence. I dare you to ask for evidence. I double dog, triple dog, hot dog, and hamburger dare you to expect God. Test the prophet. If it's a prophet, the word shouldn't fall to the ground. How dare you speak on God's behalf and God ain't said nothing? That's blasphemy. You'll get struck down for things like that. Getting God's people all excited about things. I'm coming from his word. And I'm simply telling you that your season. I, I'm, I'm almost done. I'm almost done. Almost done. Almost done. Almost done. Almost done. Almost done. Do you know the issue we have with the, the, the scholars, the Pharisees, and the well-educated in the Word of God people, the people who know the Word backwards and forward, the Pharisees, and Pharisees, that they could determine certain things but couldn't tell what kind of weather was? You can't tell the climate you're in. You can't tell your climate. You can't tell your season. 
You don't know what kind of weather you're about to dress for, then you won't be dressed appropriately. Either you'll freeze to death or get wet from the water. But you can determine what kind of season you're about to go into. You can cover yourself appropriately. You can put the right garments so that you can get through that season without even thinking about it. And I'm trying to tell you right now that God is putting a spirit of faith on you to clothe you for another season. To get ready for the, the, the climate change can be changed by your word. Oh, let me quit. Let me quit here. The, the changing can happen if you desire it. How many want that change? Hold up, wait a minute. Y'all put too many deadly hands up in the air. There's authority in them hands. Don't point them at me. You understand what kind of power emanating from your fingertips right now? If you pull the trigger in the name, if you pull the trigger, because you got your weapon up right now. Okay. You, you, When you go home, point your hand around your house. When you go home, pull your hand out, just like you were aiming at me a few minutes ago. And let whatever it is that's in your home that should not be there any longer exit by any means necessary. Window, roof, because I'm coming in the roof, you're going through the roof. As I come in, you got to get out. I'm coming with breakthrough, you got to go. Negativity, foolishness, fear, worry, unbelief, you have got to go. And anything that come across, listen, I remember when I was a child, we had a certain things. We weren't like this generation now. You couldn't find a gun. You know, unfortunately, you can find a gun real quick. Back then, when I was a small kid, you found a rock or a piece of stick, and you put it on the person's shoulder. And if you knock my mama off the person to the cliff, I got to fight you. Because that's my mama in the form of a stick. <laughs> and you just broke her neck. And you even had no regard. You popped off like nobody's business. Oh, you can't do my mama like that. I'm itching to fight. Because my mama ain't no stick on somebody's shoulder, number one. <laughs> you know how many times the enemy put things on somebody's shoulder and said, I dare you. Oh my God, I hate that. You know, I wish I was a fly on the wall when you finish praying and you're home today. You hear me? I wish I was a fly on the wall because somebody's saying certain things are moving out my life. Today, not tomorrow. Certain things have got to go. I don't know where you're going, but you got to get out of here. I got one more movie story. Remember Ways in that Hill when she got rid of that man with the vest on outside? He was there hollering, singing that song. <laughs> well, it was Ways in Hill, wasn't it? Yeah. And he thought he could just drop by, Leon. but she got a hold of herself. What was his name? Leon. 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 He had no shirt on, coming down with leather vest. It's hot as it. Some out there. And Leon singing to you. But she had enough of Leon. How many had enough of Leon? <laughs> I don't care what you're singing, Leon. You ain't getting back up here again. No, you ain't. What she did to you, Orange Adam? He needed some vitamin C. Got tired of it. He said, I know my value. I know who I am. And I'm allowing you to make me think I'm less than who I am. And when she started breathing, <laughs> she found enough courage to find an orange and sling it, which means you ain't going to steal my fruit no more either. You're not going to take my abundance any longer. And I got enough fruit left over to get you out of my life. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Let me pray for you right now. Let me pray for you right now. Because some of y'all was giving me a hard time in faith. That's why I kept on going. You kept on saying, but, 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 but. Tried to get in the verb, but probably through the subject too. No, no, no more buts. No more crowd is in my way. No more I have nobody to help me. 
I'm not disregarding help. If you send it, Lord, I need it. But send the right kind of help, not any kind of help. Send me the four purposes of my life. Send me that power. Send me that purpose. Send me those people. Send me that position. Allow these seasons of my life to connect. As I go through each and every season, make me better than I've ever been before. Lord, you planted a seed in the earth. And the word of God, you said you are patient as a husband waiting for the fruit to come back. You're waiting for what you planted. You planted something in me that must come forth as a harvest. It must come forth as pure gold. Lord, the devil is trying to put delay in my life. He's trying to put denial in my life. He's probably put depression in my life. He tried to put down in my life. But no matter what it is, at the end of the day, I give my life over to you. And because you are my life, not just an afterthought, not just a suggestion, you're the very foundation of my life. Thank you, Lord, for lifting off the limitations of my life. Thank you, Lord, for receiving the, the, the circumstances that were holding me back, the ceilings that were preventing me from getting close to you and getting close to purpose and destiny, the things that were blocking me. I thank you, God, in the name of Jesus. Because while I was on my mat, I had time to think about things. While I'm on my mat, I had time to contemplate things. I had time to meditate things. And while I was on that mat, Lord, I made up my mind. It's time for me to get out of here. It's time for me to get up out of this. It's time for me to stay from unstuck. It's time for me to be released from this situation. You've not appointed me to wrath, nor have you appointed me to death. So I expect, Lord God, you'll make a way out of nowhere. Over the crowd, over the roof, over the ceilings, over the things of life. Over my physical limitations, my mental limitations, my emotional limitations, and my spiritual limitations. I thank you, God, that you've given me a power of breakthrough. And nothing, nothing can prevent me from getting real close to you, getting in your face, hearing your words speak directly to me. I praise you in advance, God, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, I thank you in advance for my dream will come to pass. My vision will come to pass. My purpose will come to pass. The power that you've been holding up for me will come to pass. I receive with faith this morning, Father, the evidence, the evidence of things hoped for. I receive, Father, the fruit of the Spirit. I receive in the name of the Lord. I receive forgiveness of my sins, forgiveness in my soul. I'm free in the name of Jesus. Satan no longer has something on me. No longer has ties connected to me. No longer connect me any further to condemnation. I'm free from my past and free from a bad present. I thank you that my future is so bright that you have more for me than the devil stuck from me. In the name of Jesus, I praise you in advance, in advance, in advance, in advance. Tear the roof off, Lord. Tear the roof off my finances. Tear the roof off my children. Tear the roof off my spouse. Tear the roof off my family. Tear the roof off the things that are blocking and limiting me right even that ministry, Father. That calling, no matter what it is, Master, we decree and declare in the name of Jesus that the devil no longer has a say-so in our freedom. In Jesus' name. Give God praise, somebody. Yes. He's a God of the breakthrough. Come on, let me talk to you. We worship you.
keep singing, but very low. I'm going to do something, I actually do something that's going to seem a little odd, a little strange. But we just read a story that was kind of odd. Somebody going through the roof and the ceiling to meet Jesus. That's not normal. Matter of fact, some place that's called trespassing. But he did it. He did something unusual. He did something different. He did something unexpected. He did something out the norm. He did something not everybody would do. And God didn't look at him like, you're weird or something wrong with you. No, 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 no. God honored his faith. Because everything he did was driven by faith and believing in God. And God ignited a fire in him that could only be satisfied by his presence. God initiated this thing. That word that he was hearing initiated him. It caused him to see his future. He saw himself getting up. Even before he got up, he saw himself getting up. Not only that, he was ready to get up. But he had to do something a little different. I heard God tell me to tell you all, symbolically, what it is that you need to have breakthrough this morning and bring it to the altar and just lay it right here. I don't know what it is. It could be some health issues, some family concerns, some mental whatever it is. But if you can just use your imagination, which you quite often do, but in this context for a positive good, God gives you imagination. As a matter of fact, he even says, I can go above and beyond what you either ask, think, or imagine. I want you to see yourself out. Can you see yourself out? I can reinforce it, confirm it, but you got to see it first. And then you got to bring what it is that held you back and say it's here now. Because I'm not going home with it. I'm not taking it home with me. It's not getting in my car. It's not riding the metro with me. It's not on the bus. I don't want to smell it. I don't want to have it nowhere around. So I want you to hold what it is or whoever it is or all that combined, your whole life circumstance and say, my season changes today. And I'm moving forward to the kingdom. So by faith, if you could just grab what that is, bring it to the altar because he's the Lord of the breakthrough. He's the Lord of the breakthrough. It don't take long. It don't take long at all. It just come, if you just, it's here, Lord. I leave it right now. My back problem, my family problem, my money problem. I'm, oh, I feel the Holy Ghost up here. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Maybe it's heartbreak. Maybe it's unforgiveness. I don't know what it is. But you can't take it out of this room with you. You can't take it with you. Let it go. 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 It's blocking your view of God. Forget the roof. Forget the ceiling. It's here. I know regrets. I'm going through my future. Yes. 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 I hear God saying, give me yes. 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 My God. Don't take all day. Don't take all night. Believe God. Believe God. Believe God. Yes. Healing is moving on this stage. I can feel it. I can feel it. I can feel it. The Holy Ghost is on this altar right now. Like never before. Father, bless her. Strengthen her. Encourage her. Move the obstacles out the way. Move the barriers. I curse the curse and the decree deliverance in me today. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. We worship you. We worship you. Come on. 
Come on, let him have his way. 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 Brand new day. Brand new life. Yes. Hallelujah. Hey. understand this worship is warfare you may not think it is but it's warfare sometimes we think warfare is just saying bind the devil and Satan all of that the Holy Ghost is sharing with me why you all were doing what you were just doing you just struck back at the devil like you've never done before you swung a blow at Satan didn't even realize you was doing it and see, the problem is, you think too much of him while you're swinging at him. You can't exalt him and bind him at the same time. You can't put him on a plateau and a level at the same time and want to defeat him. You cannot see him as an equal. You cannot even see him as a, a challenge to God himself. Maybe to you, but not to God. But when you walked up here just now, warfare was going on. You know what you just did? 
You put angels on assignment. Or they've been waiting for their assignment. You put angels on assignment. What are you talking about? Remember when the Lord was in the garden of Gethsemane, said to me, he said, put your sword up, Peter. I can bring angels because I'm on assignment. And for somebody this morning, you got a glimpse of your purpose yonder. And because you did, your assignment qualifies you for angels to protect you like you've never been protected before. You've been qualified just because you came up here and let go of that so you can let go of him. I mean it from the soul of my soul and my heart of my heart. That warfare, without you even saying nothing, was waged on your behalf. And all you did was lift up holy hands. Because the goal of the warfare is so you don't do that, that you don't give God worship. Remember all the devil wanted from Jesus was his worship. Just bow down to me. Feel yourself with that suffering, that pain, those who are turning their back on you, just worship me. But whatever you did this morning, God is looking at you. And I'm going to tell you something. I can't say everybody, but God is pleased this morning. I can tell for sure, for sure, that he's pleased. Because you didn't let your flesh get in the way. You didn't let what other people thought about you get in the way. You didn't let this and that get in your way. Even if you didn't understand everything I was saying, something was resonating in your soul, in your spirit. Just I hear God in this. And because you moved on the voice you heard beyond me, now we can say, touch not my anointing, and do my prophets no harm. Now we can say that with certainty, because the purpose of heaven is on you right now. And you're not just invoking a right that you have no right to, a position you have no access to. You are now saying, Lord, I'm qualified. Not because I'm smart, not because I'm strong. It's because I believe you. I trust you. How many trust the Lord with all your heart? Tell somebody, I ain't got another choice. And let me say, get cute about it. Peter said, where are we going to go? You got the words of life. Where are we going to go? You got the word of life. The devil been trying to make you quit. Your flesh been trying to get you to quit. Your mind been trying to get you to quit. But see, what God had in store for the devil this morning was a sneak attack. In the form of a worship in the form of a praise. Give God one big hand clap right now. Uh, wow. Yeah. You know, I wish we had recorded you earlier in service. And the service, the, the, the clap I just got, versus one we had about an hour ago, is two different versions. I didn't even have to give you much encouragement. Matter of fact, I almost had to make you stop. You first came in and had to shake off the earth, shake off the flesh, walk out of here this morning clothed in a whole armor, walk out of here this morning knowing that God got the victory. And let me encourage you this wise, if you encounter opposition, it's because you qualify for the opposition. And the opposition said, you're going to go, I'm going to try to keep up with you. Don't be surprised. Do you understand? After Saul had met the prophet Samuel, after looking for his daddy's animals, the prophets, I've been waiting for you for two days. I got food, diddles cooking for you, waiting on you. You lost something so you could find yourself. You lost your daddy's property so you can find your own property. But I had to get you to get after something that don't belong to you, chase after something that's not yours, so I can give you what's yours. Now that you made it to the prophet, he don't fed you the word. 
He gave him a word. He said, don't go the same way you came in. Go out a different way. Matter of fact, the Philistines are waiting for you over the hill. My question, how do they know I'm anointed so fast? Because the anointed that can't be tested cannot be trusted. So don't be surprised if the devil try to test what you heard this morning. Don't be shocked it look like it's going left before it go right. That's the proof. He ain't robbing no bank that ain't got no money in it. He can't kill what ain't living. He can't steal what ain't nothing value there. He can't destroy what ain't built up. So don't be surprised if he try to do what he normally do. Because not only does he lie to you, he lie to himself. Give God praise, somebody. I can go on and on and on and on. That's why I give him praise. Not for us, but him. All right. Have a seat if you can. That's going to wear me out. <laughs> well, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, wait. Listen, as my children in the spirit, I can't go up without you. I can't shift without you. I'm not called to shift by myself. So if my season is changing, Yours got chained with me. Yeah. We grow together, not just go together. <laughs> and we're going to go together too, to glory. Amen. So if the Lord is loosening me to say certain things I probably would have said a year or two ago, that means your appetite has changed. And the child you was when you first came here is gone. You're not, you're not that same child that you was a year ago. That's why God's going to give you some meat and not just milk. Because meat is where the protein is. Milk is for the babies. Because they're not fully developed. But how many have your, exor your discernment exercise? That means you don't have some troubles, some trials and tribulations if you don't came out of it. Now you've had your, your, your senses exercised. Amen. God worked it. It wasn't always happy and always peaceful, but he worked your senses. You said, work my nerve. That's not the Bible. <laughs> working on your nerve. And your last nerve at that. God is going to strengthen you this week. I cannot tell you enough. I cannot tell you enough. But I can hear my soul. Some of y'all say, I don't think it's ever going to be over. It's always, it's always gonna be dark. Look like I got bad luck, and I don't even believe in luck. Here's what, I'm gonna give you some something to meditate on. Go into the book of Psalms this week. Go into the book of Psalms. I'm gonna do something that's a little dangerous because I'm not being specific about what Psalm to read. But I could say Psalm 150, Psalm of Warfare, Psalm 39, Psalm 139. There's a bunch of them I could give you. But you and the Holy Ghost got a date. And he's taking you to dinner. What's on the plate is your psalm. How many want to go to dinner with Jesus? Y'all so cute. <laughs> so do I. He is going to lead you. Because when you first got, how many when you first got saved, you asked God to lead you in the word? And that time, it kept going to the psalm, didn't it? For me, it was always psalm. I said, no, I'm talking about keep going to the psalm. It's called gravity. You had to have a strategy, not just the weight of the book naturally falling in half because that's a physical thing. I thought it was a supernatural move of God. It was actually physics. But sometime it was God. And God would have a right now word. And I believe God, he's going to speak to you in that psalm that you're going to be led. Don't read all of them. Just read one of them. All right? And the one that you read, read it over and over again. Lord, you will speak supernaturally with a voice like myself speaking out loud, verbally and vocally, in their heart, soul, and spirit. And that psalm will leap off the pages. 
One dimension will become three dimensional. And every part of their body, mind, soul, and spirit, will see and receive the spirit of the word that's being spoken. A rhema, a right now. I mean, Lord, be the prophet in the scripture. Those who even don't know how to read the Bible, don't even know where to start at, you'll lead their fingers, you'll guide their thoughts, and their eyes will lock in. And you will scare them with joy. Because they will experience you in a dimension they never experienced. Before. I can feel the chills and the goosebumps as you talk to them, even now, God, literally through your word, exposing yourself, revealing yourself, revealing to them thoughts and means they never dreamed of. Don't take them out of their mind, but expand their minds. Because you've got to put that enter into their minds. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Oh, you in for a treat. You are in for a treat. Now, find a space and a time for you to talk to you. Get away from the crowd. Sit in the car like you do sometimes. You know, sometimes you don't want to go in the house. Either it's too good to go in the house or it ain't good in the house. Whatever it is, being in the car sometimes is just where your praise and your devotion is in that house, in the car. Amen? You know, can't use the bathroom. Maybe you could. Some places are, are suitable. But run the water so they think you're doing something. <laughs> Amen. Get on the side of the tub and don't even get in it. Just let God talk to you. Amen. Close the door. Lock the door. Let the kids say, what's wrong with mommy? Mommy ain't been in there for a good long. You all right in there? Amen. Now, if they do get concerned because your praise busted out and you try to keep it to yourself, don't be surprised. Amen. Don't be ashamed of the glory that's on you either. Refresh. Refresh is the word of God. Refresh, renew. That's the word of God for you. Refreshing and renewal. As your soul prospers and in good health. This is the part many souls miss. You don't get that soul prosperity. For that money coming, for that people coming, for that job coming, your soul got to be right. You know why? So you can't be bought. My soul has been bought by the blood, so you can't afford me. You can't buy this. It's already been bought. That's why prosperity is my servant, not the other way around. It serves me. I don't serve it. Serve Jesus and everything else he gives me is a tool. Amen. Let's do an offering. You know, I don't know how to follow up behind Jesus personally. I can follow up behind you and I can come up with something, but coming behind God, I don't know what to do. But to get out of his way and say, Lord, keep on doing what you're doing. And help me not to mess up what you're doing. I can mess it up. Talking too much, saying the wrong thing. You know, you can overdo it sometimes. You gotta back up and let God do what he's gonna do. How many members here? I wanna thank you for your giving. I appreciate your offers and your tithes. And we pray that we're good stewards and good managers over the things. We have not done things to the point we're in debt. And we have to constantly come before you with an emergency situation to raise certain funds and keep things going. The Lord has been good to us and he's been faithful to that. We don't have everything we want, but we got everything in need in Jesus Christ. Amen? So when I ask for these offerings to sustain our stewardship, sustain it. That is to maintain what we're doing for the kingdom. I have one more question, actually. It may sound like it's whatever, but is the word worth it? That's all I'm asking. Is it worth it? Say it again. It's rhetorical, but some people don't see the value of what I just did, or what God just said to me to tell you. They might look at it as just a speech, a conversation, a talk, and they miss the spiritual elements. They don't hear God. He that have the ear, let him hear. But if you don't have the ear to hear, it's just another whatever. It's just another whatever. But thank God he proves who he is. How many have been blessed because you've been here? Have you grown a bit? 
How you been stretched a little bit? Have you seen God move? Because our kind of ministry is focused for the healings and the miracles. But how about the people growing up? I can pray for folk to get healed and still be in the same mindset they walked in the same place. Just because your body healed don't mean your mind is healed. When he said go and sin no more to that woman, that means change your thinking so you can change your lifestyle. Go and sin no more. Stop hanging around them guys that will do those kind of things to you. Stop hanging around those people. Find yourself a different circumstance. Come out those conditions. You're no longer that woman. Go and sin no more. Stop being the old you. Stop being the new you. That's the will of God. This morning, that's the word of God to you. It's a brand new you. Celebrate you. Happy birthday. Get your cupcake. <laughs> Amen. Celebrate who God is doing in your life. Praise the Lord. Ten of you that can sort of see the $71, please come at this time. Ten of you. What kind of shoebox is that? Good Lord. I'm just saying, I'm, the, the people who serve in this church are not just servants, they're givers. And they bless me and humble me because they think about stuff I ain't thinking about. Like this. I never thought of that. Whose idea was that? Well, that one didn't work out, did it? <laughs> I forgot what kind of church this is. The prophet gonna find out <laughs> whether you know, whether you want to know not. Every time somebody try to do stuff like that, I find out. Yes. I, it always happens. I always find out. It's all right, though. It's all love. Let me offer before the Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for grace and mercy for kindness and long-suffering, for care that we couldn't even do for ourselves. You demonstrated your care and love because we're here right now. I thank you for healing in my body from the top of my head to the sole of my feet. I thank you for the money in my hand because for us of you, it is there. And Lord, I'm sowing good seed in the good ground, expecting a return that you promised you would, that whatsoever man sow of that shall he also reap. Let it be used for your kingdom to be built. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. Bring your offering before the Lord. Sure. All right? You all right? They got your song ready? I thought they was about to do a duet. They just waiting for the mic. <laughs> Amen. Those that have not so, please come up with a $40 offering or more. Do the best you can. If you ain't got a dime, still come anyhow. Still come anyhow. Still come regardless. Figure them glasses out that I gave you. Lift you off here before the Lord. You know, I got to pray for two areas. 
I'm not going to call nobody out because of time, but if you're dealing with arthritis in your body at any point, I'm praying for your healing now. Every dimension, every feeling of arthritis in your joints, in your arms, your legs, no matter where it's manifesting itself, I speak to that evil lying spirit in your health and curse it to the root in Jesus' name and decree and declare that it is laid here on the altar and that you're walking out here healed in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, bless this offering and bless the souls you're sowing. Let them see a financial miracle in seven days. In Jesus' name. Amen. Drop your seat before the Lord. Give God praise for her healing. She came to show me her healing. She got prayed for, and God has done a miracle in her hands. Nobody but Jesus can do that. Lord, for signs, wonders, miracles, and healing in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. As they say back in the. Uh, what's up? I don't need this. Monica, do not interrupt me. Help me understand. I have one two testimony we need to pray for. First testimony, remember when you pray about the money a couple months back then? Yeah. Well, I received an unexpected phone call and I went to the money and the job. Oh. oh. Anyway, just, uh, last month the cops came to my house. Choo -choo -choo -choo. They're like, oh, I speak to Brianna. I was like, oh. <laughs> so I was like, hold on. I said, Brianna, come downstairs. What did you do? She said, I need a lift. So they called her out, said, I'll come outside with her. They said, Maybe you need to bring a pack. I can't bring money. This is my house. They said, You bring a pack. So I went inside. I'm very serious. We go in the courthouse, two of us. We go upstairs, ain't nobody there. Ain't nobody. So 
So, you know, I'm, me and Brother Little, we want to bless you. Can you bless the team? <laughs> yeah, right, right. Yeah. doesn't matter. I'm glad you're not good at it. And anyway, so when I said, and I, told, I was telling her, my brother, my daughter's been here since that was, she couldn't come to court. Mm -hmm. I did come for her, but the lady, the prosecutor told me to go home. I said, I said, and I said, and so we, we go back to May 30th, and then Brianna was like, uh, you be my judge till we talk to you to Ms. Tiffany Price. So I'm the judge. But it, this was nothing but age. You know how fast we just talk about age? That was age. It's just like Viper, she got age in her too, and I'm going to go with the Bye. Beautiful. You praise him anyhow. If you don't, you're going to be in trouble. Speaking of prayer, how many members here were on the prayer yesterday? God bless you. Give yourself a big hand. A number I was given was almost 260 some people was on the prayer call. Do you understand 200 plus people do not even show up to a prayer meeting in person? And then come on a Saturday too? That is amazing. 200 plus, I was so impressed. I've never seen nothing like that in terms of a prayer call that everybody was on, a part of the prayer for the 12 hours. We did the 12 hours. Yeah, for 12 hours to do that and for 200 plus, please, Lord, bless these people. Bless them. So, I mean, I want God to bless you to your hurt. A good hurt. Because that fact that y'all, yeah, I mean, to do that is amazing. As a pastor, I'm godly proud of my members. It inspires me and encourages me and humbles me. You know, I'm surrounded by a company of people who don't just come to church, they the church. And the number one thing is you didn't wait on me that you started praying anyhow. You understand that's the kind of prayer that got Peter out of jail? Yeah, it wasn't the apostles praying, it was the members praying. Next thing you know, Peter knocking on the door. Now I ain't locked up, but thank God. I'm not trying to say nothing. But y'all better not forget how to pray like that. <laughs> That's all I'm just saying. Just keep that kind of prayer in your pocket. I don't want to be in a situation where I'm going to need y'all to pray the Peter prayer over my life. But it's good to know you got backup. Amen. So please give yourself another hand. 200, I believe it was like 268 people came out for prayer. That is just impressive. Some people may say that's no big deal. It's a big deal to me. And let me share, every person who prayed mattered. And every person who prayed, God heard. So don't despise the dead small thing and don't think that you don't matter. You are part of the body of Christ and you proved it by what you did yesterday. That was a great thing for me to see as well. I, I, I can't wait to talk to the mother preachers. Pastors. Oh, I love it. Oh, yes, I will. Trust me, because that's what they do. I've been around some folk that got thousands of members and I'm not knocking out. Thank God for all the responsibilities they got. And that's the fact that you got some, that's a responsibility. To have many people like that, you had to be qualified to carry that kind of people. 
So I, I thank God for the grace in their lives to have that. They're not my competition, they're my completion. So I don't compete with another church with all that. Thank God for as many as possible. But this ain't butter knife for the spirit, this sword of the spirit. Amen. This, this is a sharp two-edged sword. Amen. I think one member said, Pastor, I was going to my cutting you. He's going to cut you. It ain't like that. I'm just talking about the word of God. I'm just happy that you that you love God that way. And I appreciate you. Thank God for our first time guests, visitors who are with us this morning. Thank God for the, those who are watching by way of the uh, internet, by social media around the country. I mean, yeah, I got some members. A lot of my family members have been logging. I appreciate each and every last one of you. And uh, I actually seen some of my childhood friends watching. Which, and I, I thank God for that because a lot of them I pray for. And we've gone to different paths in life. And I don't want to, to uh, I don't know, say the word, scare them off or pressure on them about finding. I want them to find Christ, the way I found the Lord. And I don't try to push Jesus on nobody. I present Jesus to you by my, uh, my lifestyle. I don't push him. I just present him. And that if you get him or not, that's fine. If I believe that he'll bless you. But the same token, it's good to see certain people in your life that you thought wouldn't be in your life. Who knows what season they're in? And there are people now who have turned to Christ because maybe it got to a place where life has gotten tough for them. Instead of criticizing how they got here, thank God they're here. You know, you can speak a whole lot of things. Should have been here, should have done that. Whatever it takes for you to get Jesus, as long as you get Jesus, that's all that matters to me. How many got something out the word? Amen. I want you to thank God for our camera crew, our audio crew, our ushers, our concierges, our praise team, our musicians, our ministry staff, our cooks, our dishwashers, our Sunday school teachers. Amen. And if we had a dog, thank God for the dog walker. We thank God. How many here have pets? Got pets? Let me pray for your pet. Your pet's like your, 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 your child, ain't it? Amen. I know somebody said, you going to pray for my pet? Yeah, we're going to pray for your pet. You feed them like they're they grown, like they're kids. Amen. Something happened to him, you're going to be heartbroken. You know? That's why I only got fish now. Because they just keep their eyes open and don't say nothing back. I ain't got to walk them, just watch them swim. But they know me when I come down. They, they know. They come food. <laughs> Father, bless the animals in people's lives right now. Let them be good stewards over them as animals over the animals. Let them be... Blessings over their animals. Let them be managed like David was over the sheep. Let them be blessed to those animals. And let those animals be submissive and a blessing to them, protect them from sickness, disease, and even heartbreak. I praise you, right, Father, that you put them in their lives to be a blessing to them. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I don't know why you can't receive that blessing. Why not? Why not? You can bless what you need to bless, and God will honor it. Please stand up on your feet. We're about done here. Yes, ma'am. Something? What's that announcement? Um, if you need to make up classes from the um, New Millers classes that were just completed the other week, um, it's going to be on May 18th. Make sure you reach out to um, Deaconess Quincy Cox, please, so you can complete your class, your classes. We have a make up date to sign the answer. These classes are important, please. There's a reason why you're in this church, and you must understand what we believe. I don't want you to be on the false pretense, and church is just church. Churches may have a, a Christian background, but how we interpret the Bible and how we live the word may be a, a, a course of discussion, a course of conversation. And I want you to know where you're at and what you're hearing and what you believe. I've been in a situation where I thought it was God, and it wasn't God. They said enough Jesus to make me listen, then I couldn't find out, like, wow. This ain't nothing, this is almost a cult. You know, so I need you to know where you at and what you believe. Find out what we believe. Don't give your money. Don't give your time. Don't give your support to something that's not godly. Amen. I, I, I elicit discernment. Check me out. If I'm saying something out of error in the word of God, send me a question. Say, Pastor, that's not in the scripture. I ain't got no problem with listening to that. I have a conversation about what we think about the word of God is. If I need to be corrected, I'm open to that kind of correction. Because it's more important to be right than be right in your own regard. Amen? And I don't want to stand before the Lord and say, you lied to them people, brother. Depart from me. No, ma'am. No, sir. Will not happen.
Father, we thank you this morning for your grace. Thank you for lifting the roof off, the limitations. Thank you, Lord, for presenting options where there was no option but to get off this mat. I thank you, Lord, because the Holy Ghost has spoken this morning that physical mats, spiritual mats, mental mats, emotional mats are no longer needed. I thank you that the four seasons of life are ushering me to the future, ushering me to the present place where you are resided. I thank you that destiny and purpose is no longer calling. I'm walking with purpose and destiny. It's not just a place, it's a position. So I thank you, Lord, for a new position, even mentally, emotionally, psychologically, and spiritually. As I leave out this place, but not your presence, I'm thankful for revelation, inspiration, and information to put me on my destination. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Step two, because you ain't seen nothing yet.